and our health editor, Dr Hillary, along with the broadcaster, Tricia Goddard, who is undergoing life-extending treatment after her breast cancer returned. Tricia, it is Hi, terrific to see you this morning. How are you doing? I'm fine, apart from the fact that it's the middle of the night here. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. but thank Apologies. you very much. And a very good reason for keeping you up, which is, of course... Last Friday, everyone knocked sideways by the Princess of Wales doing that in very emotional, moving speech, sitting on the bench, explaining the reasons behind the fact that she hasn't been public, that she has a cancer diagnosis. It just struck me listening to her that a 1,000 people in the UK would be receiving that news the same day as we saw the Princess of Wales delivering her news. And at one stage, of course, you were one of them. What, what did it make you think? Well, uh, listening to the message, uh, uh, I felt for her because I know what it's like to have to talk about something very personal when you feel kind of cornered into it. And I really do believe that Catherine was kind of cornered into it for many, many different reasons. She knew people were taking videos of her and um, she knew the children would be on holiday soon and they'd be swept up into that madness. Um, all of the conspiracy theories, people discussing it and what have you. Um, and, you know, you, you get to the point where it's not tenable to do what is your right, really, which is keep your private life private. So I felt for her. My heart went out to her um, for that as much as, um, you know, some some poor, as I said to myself, some poor cow's got to be a statistic. And I was really sorry that she kind of joined the club. But as you say, there's over three million people in the UK living, living with cancer. Um, I also kind of feel for her because uh, did, I don't know if you heard, and I really want to highlight this, if nothing else. At the end of her message, um, what she said, not once did she use the term battling cancer? Mm. Fantastic. <laughs> Most of us would, who live with this hate that. How do you battle cancer? Biff, 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 biff. It's stupid. There's the, the headline saying cancer stricken Prince Charles. It's disgusting. It's triggering. Once upon a time, we had stupid language like that around mental health. Journalists, we need to do better. We need to grow the hell up. You talk about the pressures of being in the public eye and coping with the diagnosis. Obviously, Kate has, has withdrawn into her privacy. You actually had to leave the country, didn't you? Well, in the end, uh, that's what I did. Yeah, uh, I talked about that in the past. And I, I, I went through... Um, I've been told things are better now. Um, but uh, the intrusion, the press intrusion was so horrific. My children are still, even now they're adults, they are still traumatised by being followed by, you know, um, people pretending to deliver flowers. Do you know, my in 2008, news of my diagnosis, I, I walked through my door having just got my diagnosis for the phone ringing from a newspaper news desk saying, we've heard you're dying. Now, I hadn't told my my then dad, my, my dad was still alive. I hadn't told anybody. And yet they were threatening to splash it all over the newspapers. And that is how it went on. And I worked every single day. Um, and thank God I had my own production team. And thank God for the gorgeous people in Norwich, my team in Norwich, who helped mm. keep me safe at work. But my private life... Well, kind of right went to, out the window. You're right to say it's changed. It has changed. And I don't think anybody would seriously suggest that the mainstream media in this country uh, breached Kate's privacy in the way that your privacy was breached. Those things have changed. It's social media that's the problem. Uh, listen, we want to talk to you about how you tell the children when you get this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Let's just see a little clip about that relevant part of, uh, of what Kate had to say on Friday. So how did you tell your much younger at the time children, uh, Trish? Um... <laughs> Uh, I kind of knew their personalities. Um, I told them together, as one should. I just did on, on my show. I did just this subject. Um, and they then they reacted in the way that I thought they, they might, um, according to their personalities. At the time, if you remember, Kylie Minogue had gone through breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I sort of said to them, look, you know, 
uh, look at Kylie Minogue. You know? And I said to them, just treat me as mummy. Do not treat me as a sick person or anything. Treat me as mummy. I have to say, as teenagers, once one of my daughters was giving me such hell, I burst into tears and said, please go back and treat me as a sick person. Stop this teen <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but, you know, but you, you, you talk to children in age appropriate uh, ways together um, because children will know if you take one aside and tell them and they also know if you're holding something back um, so you know you 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 also pick their time you don't do it before bedtime um, you know you do it after a meal uh, just practical things like that you do it all sitting we did it sitting around uh, the table you do it all sitting together not standing over somebody or what have you and but as a mum, you want to protect your children. Uh, I think it's OK for them to see emotion. It really is. But you you can say, you know, sometimes a mummy feels a bit upset. Mummy feels a bit, ugh, you know, things like that. I think you just be, you just be honest with them in an age-appropriate manner. Trisha, I just wonder what you made of the social media conspiracy theories, all of the discussion, the trolling... Uh, online, we're asking this morning whether it is right and proper for those who are very, perhaps even equally high profile, you know, you have sort of a Hollywood star like Blake Lively saying um, she wanted to say sorry for mocking, I think it was the Mother's Day photograph, You've got Owen Jones, who's a political commentator who has very many large number of followers on Twitter saying he was ashamed about what he'd said. There are other um, celebrities, Stephen Colbert, I think, did a sketch over in the States, which, you know, felt tasteless at the time, frankly. Um, we can't talk about the content of it. Um, whether he should apologise. Do you think she takes any notice of it? I mean, I just don't read the comments. When I, when I don't like the comments, I don't read them. I actually find it more upsetting stuff that's in the papers sometimes when I yeah. read that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, Agreed. Agreed. And, in fact, Sarah Vine of the Daily Mail, very high-profile, influential columnist, has apologised. But do you th is this just free speech, Tricia? You know, you're a great broadcaster. You know how important it is for people to be able to speak freely. So is it just free speech? Sometimes it's going to hurt. Suck it up. Or is it, mm. no, you know what? There's a moment when you just say, we got it wrong, sorry. I think it's up to each person if they want to apologise. If they genuinely feel sorry, they should say sorry. I actually have more respect for people who are vile and when they find out the truth, still stay vile because often they still think the same thing, but they're just going through the, the motions. Look, I agree with you, Susanna. I find what's printed in the newspapers, and let us not forget... Um, the print that the, the newspapers print, you know, and online newspapers often are the ones that light the match to the bonfire. They went into the photograph, you know, the Mother's Day photograph with all those little things circled and what have you. I mean, that was manna for heaven for comedians, et cetera, et cetera. So I think sometimes if the press didn't make such a big thing about it, uh, it, it wouldn't be seen as a fair game. But I agree with you. You can't go through the social media. That Trolls will always be there. I've always been a champion for people with mental illness. What we don't talk about are people with mental illness health who use social media instead of uh, getting help. <laughs> yeah, it's always going to be there. Well, let's, let's just bring in our two uh, suited and booted journos here in the studio. Do you think that the British press the, and the world's press, but let's talk about the UK press, was wrong to run those pictures with the little circles around all the altered uh, images? No, no. no for, for the very good reason. Those pictures were pulled by four incredibly respected mm. international picture, picture agents, Reuters, uh, and so you have to explain why they were pulled, and they were pulled because I would never have used the word manipulated for those for the photograph, but those, the photograph in Ed, so you have to explain why. Mm. Mm. No, it was, le it was legitimate um, to point out what was presented as a news photograph had been edited. Mm. It was also legitimate to ask questions. It's, it's all about the tone and then whether you go into the world of conspiracy theories yeah. and you're getting all the made-up mm -hmm. stuff mm. and also the very... It, incredibly poisonous personal attacks on her. Well, and now we know, according to the Daily Telegraph, that behind some of the most poisonous attacks 
are three hostile state actors, yeah. China, Russia yeah. and Iran. Senior government figures fear that they are behind the spread of wild conspiracy, theor conspiracy theories and online rumours. I mean, Russia is so good at this cyber stuff. Yeah. They're so good. And today, actually... But what are they saying? And how does it destabilise? Well, this... Are we all then part of this destabilisation process? The, the, the monarchy is, a, for me, oh. it's a <clears throat> central part of British <clears throat> national life. <clears throat> and the monarchy's been having a pretty tr difficult time with the, yeah. the health of the king and the princess of Wales. And some of the abuse has been so appalling. It's been, I think it's destabilised. come on, the... And I think it has been propagated the, by the, rogue states. The problem's homegrown. And we've got enough people doing this who are born and bred and live in Britain. Yes, these states deserve condemnation if they're sponsoring units that are feeding it and fueling it and taking part in it. But we, you know, it's quite convenient in a way to yeah, point the finger but, abroad but, but, rather than say, look, there are there are there yeah, are neighbours, cool. workmates, people we friends, you know, people we know who. But, have but been just doing on this, this point today, Oliver Down, who's the deputy prime minister, is going to make a statement in the Commons yes. talking about how the Chinese state has uh, deliberately been targeting the electoral commission it's got it's gained access They've hacked to MPs accounts haven't they absolutely yes. and personal details of 40, 40 million, million uk people. voters and that is coming today and i suspect he will also address this suggestion are that you, they be possibly well, can we just are you can telling we just, me the gchq spy center in cheltenham isn't doing this on other but the country's going it's it, unfortunately it mm -hmm. is well, our state operate to each other and we always yeah. we always look at their spying on us their right. uh, surveillance on us, we're spying on them, we have surveillance on them. Well, what about the sites too. that carry this stuff, like X and, and TikTok, what used to be... X yeah. used to be Twitter and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, in the conventional media, your media, this media, we are fully restricted we by are. libel laws, yep. slander laws, um, all, all sorts of considerations which make us think before we speak, basically, and before we write. That does not exist on social no. media, but it should, and surely it could be, it could be applied. The, I, if I had a pound for the times I've written about this, that, you know, yeah. Cameron, when David Cameron was prime minister, he was having uh, s seminars at number 10 about how to stop Facebook uh, and, and some of these other sites um, publishing bile. Hmm. And they'd never done anything about the, it. The, the, They've these, done nothing about in, it. In, in the past, these people would have been muttering in their bedrooms or in the yeah. corner of a pub. Uh, yep. And they wouldn't be heard. Now they can use whether it's X or Instagram or Facebook or any other TikTok. They can use them to get a much bigger mm. audience. Now, I, I do think those publishers, they like to present themselves as just platforms, platforms yeah. but their publishers they do have a responsibility. But it's then, where does it butt up against free speech? Mm. And free speech also includes the ability of people to say things you disagree with, and also you find... Yes, but, it, but you're not allowed to slander somebody and you're not allowed to commit a libel against somebody. No. There are laws to prevent that. Yes. Surely those laws could be applied on social media. Yeah, but those laws have to be enforced mm. by the person who is the victim of the slander yes. and the libel. Well, of course, it's often said, isn't it, that, that it's, it's, it is, quote, impossible to track down people on social media. I happen to know, because I've done a, a great deal of research on this for a novel that I've written about it, about trolling, which is coming out soon. I'm sorry, I'm not plugging the novel, I'm just saying I've done the research. You can track these people down. Right. You Go can on. track them down. Look, you can find them through their IP addresses, uh, and, and you can identify them. And if they've committed a, yep. a criminal act, from yep. slander or libel, mm. you can go after them. I, I dare say the five of us here and Trisha down the line mm. could most days find a handful, handfuls of people on social media we are defamed by mm. and yes. could sue yes. if we wish. They'll accuse you of lying yep. and things you, mm -hmm. you, you never have. But you don't, because it's not worth it. It would cost you a lot of money, a lot of effort. You what would you it. get at the end? Well, and that's the yeah. palace, in a way. I know. I, I... And I thought putting that video out, which I found very, very moving. Very moving. And, yeah. I, I, and I did think, why didn't you do it earlier? Now, maybe she wasn't ready to do it earlier. Mm. You, get, you get that again when you're watching. She there was a to woman... to her children first. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there was a woman, a young oh woman, a she mother... She they were off school. ...thinking of her children. We would yeah. all in that position do that. And you just yeah. think, right, you do it in your own time in one, in one way, but they, if, it would have been yeah. better if they the did it thing, earlier. And the the other there, there was think... a vacuum. There was an information vacuum. That was part of the mm. problem, too, which people fill on social media yeah. with yeah. their vile theories. The other thing, <clears> I think, <throat> is that it's... You know, it's one thing for people who are high profile to be targeted online. I, th I personally think we are able to ignore it. Yeah. There are filters mm -hmm. that I can put in place on Twitter and on Instagram where I simply mm. don't see it. I actually, as a mum, <clears throat> am more concerned about what teenagers 
see online, mm -hmm. not yeah. because of personal experience in my family, but mm -hmm. we interview a lot of people whose children are affected by stuff yeah, yeah. online. And I think the priority should be don't let children see awful yeah. stuff online. Yeah. Don't let children be bullied online. Don't let children be trolled online because they're much more vulnerable, I, I think, mm. than we are. It, it, and it, it doesn't have, it then feed into the debate, should children as young... Should, should they be able to have smartphones before they're 16? Yeah. But X, when it, X, when it was Twitter, had moderators, and then Elon Musk comes yeah, along, uh, who's a, a pretty <laughs> vile person... And rich. ..and he takes away a lot of those filters. And Good. you can see the abuse has gone up, the racism's gone up, the bigotry's yeah. gone up. Now, the racists and the bigots were celebrating they were back. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. Tricia, I just want to ask you, cos I'm very aware we're keeping you up, and, I, and I'd like you not <laughs> to be kept up longer than you absolutely have to. Mm. Um, there was a very significant moment at the end of Princess uh, Kate's speech to camera, which was, you are not alone. If you are in the same situation as me, as her, you are not alone. What do you think other people can get from that? Is it reassuring to someone who is also in the same situation, if you're one of the other three million who are living with cancer, what is the best advice you would give them, Tricia? How do they feel supported by Princess Kate opening up? I think the, the, the whole thing about King Charles and um, Princess Kate and Sarah Ferguson, let us not mm. forget, talking about cancer, the biggest message is cancer is no... Uh, doesn't uh, you know care yeah. whether you're a king, a queen, or rich or poor. It affects everyone. Uh, access to health uh, surely does, and diagnosis. And we know, sadly, I, I, I know she gave a really powerful message, and it, it affects you on one level. On another level, it made me feel sad for all the people waiting. And I know, I know, I've been contacted by people who've had to wait. Uh, stupid long times to get diagnoses, to get tests because of the poor NHS burden and what have you, um, who are scared, who are waiting for, for tests that they should have very quickly. And sometimes people do feel alone. So I hope the message to them is there are brilliant charities out there. There are brilliant organisations out there. And I come back to, I know there was a, an information vacuum, but basically, royals or whoever you are, my message to be is you are going through this, not anybody else. It's you. You talk about it if and when you are ready and tell everybody else to take a flying leap. <laughs> Tricia, I'd like to ask you something that, that Susanna and I were discussing and wondering about just, just before the programme, because we, we've heard overnight that uh, cancer charities here in the UK, certainly, have said there's been a spike uh, mm. since Friday, since, since Kate went on camera, um, in people coming forward, asking for advice, explaining that they think they have cancer, what should they do? There's been a, a, a real spike over the weekend. Uh, but we were wondering quite what was going through people's minds, people who possibly have suspected and been frightened about symptoms they might have had over the last few months, maybe even the last couple of years. But watching that on Friday has made them pick up the phone and go for help. Can you explain what that process might have been in their minds? What, how they would have been <laughs> motivated to do that? Sheer cold fear, uh, first and foremost. But the other thing is that... Um, that she's she's sitting there, she's talking, you know, because there are a lot of furfies around uh, cancer. I mean, cancer treatment now has, has really gone on leaps and bounds. I mean, you know, I didn't say anything about my diagnosis. It's been 20 months now, and I worked all my colleagues, none of my colleagues at CNN I've sat next to. I covered the, the, the coronation, the funerals, everything, flew to England. Nobody had an idea. And I didn't realise that when I... I didn't want to come out, really, but I kind of got to the situation I had. Um, I unwittingly, um, people said to me, you know, it, it, it told them that you live with cancer, that you can, if you're supported, if you have the right health care, 
continue to work through cancer. But many people, and I think, Richard, this is a really important point, I know that many people don't feel they can tell their workplace that they have any chronic illness, not just cancer, because they're frightened they might get fired. Mm -hmm. You know, I was frightened that I might get be let go because I'd read stories about other high-profile people who talked about their illness and were let go. And you either sensibly or what have you, but emotionally, you're frightened that you mm. people will stop seeing you for you and start seeing mm. you as, mm. oh, you poor thing, mm. you know, oh, you can't work. Mm. And you suddenly become less of a human and just one big walking diagnosis. That's a really so good I point. think, yeah, so I hope people who watched Catherine get the message that you you can prevail, yes. but you do need the right support. All right, Trish, but just before we leave this, we've got Dr Hillary here. One of the details that Kate did share with everybody uh, on Friday was that the, the treatment she's now getting is preventative. Can you explain what that means exactly? So we often use adjut adjuvant um, chemotherapy when someone's already had surgery or before they've had surgery. So, for example, if somebody had breast cancer, you might use uh, radiother radiotherapy, radiation, or chemotherapy prior to the surgery to mop up any cells which have uh, right. uh, be gone beyond where the solid tumour is found to be. Equally with abdominal surgery, it's not at all uncommon to take out uh, a, uh, an organ or a part of an organ thinking it's benign and then Always, as a routine, that a tissue would be sent off for examination under the microscope yep. and a few cancerous cells are found. Nothing to do with the original symptoms, but as an incidental finding. We call them incidentalomas. Right. So if you find something like that, you say, well, you know, it obviously hasn't reached lymph nodes, otherwise there would be secondary surgery carried out. Mm -hmm. It's still within the organ that's been removed, but just in case a cell or two cells or a few cells have escaped during the surgery into the bloodstream or the lymphatic system, right. you would think, let's use chemotherapy as, a pre as, a, as a, an insurance policy right. to make sure those uh, um, uh, cells have been mopped up by chemotherapy and now we can... Kind of a just-in-case It's a just-in-case scenario. That's interesting. It's almost like an insurance policy. We use it commonly. But, as I say, it's not at all uncommon to take out something that's um, uh, diseased and find that there is a few cells of cancer there. That's not usually going to kill the patient. That's usually going to be something that's eminently treatable with chemo for three to six months, different drugs depending on what to organ you're treating, what cells you're, you're treating, what mm -hmm. stage it's at. But it's, it's not at all uncommon. And presumably, preventative chemotherapy is, is presu I'm presuming, you, you explained, is that less intrusive and, and does that have fewer side effects than, than, than full-scale chemotherapy? Yeah, the dose would be um, a, a, an important factor, but usually in a young person, um, uh, where you're talking about a few cells, you're talking about a less invasive, right. you know, with less side effects. Mm -hmm. Side effects would still possibly include nausea, vomiting, diarrhoea, fatigue, fatigue oh. um, uh, vulnerability to frequent infections, but that would be closely mm. monitored. Blood tests would be regularly taken. So she's in really good hands. Um, it's almost certainly going to be curative, uh, and, you know, I think she could be, she, she could be reassured, and, as she is reassuring her children, mm. that she's going to be OK. That's good to hear. Dr Hillary, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Andrew, Kevin, thank you. And, of course, our thanks to Trisha Goddard. Lovely, lovely to Great see you. Great to see you again, Trisha. morning, Trisha. And um, uh, Richard mentioned that there has been a spike in interest and visits to cancer charities mm -hmm. like Cancer Research and Maggie's, and we will put details if you are affected, if you're one of the three million people uh, who is living with cancer, or you're one of the 1,000 people who will be <coughs> diagnosed today with cancer, we'll put all of that information on our website. Thanks, both. Thanks, gents.